Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, I want to remind you to go to reallifepharmacology.com and pick up your free 31-page PDF. It's a little study guide I put together on the top 200 drugs. Uh, Definitely a a good resource if you're out in clinical practice, just a great refresher. Um, Or if you're studying for board exams, things of that nature, uh, it's a nice resource to kind of have and lean on uh, just to pick up some important clinical pearls or re-remember some of the clinical pearls with uh, these medications. So again, reallifepharmacology.com, go snag that free PDF. All right, the drug of the day today is glipizide. Uh, brand name of this medication is Glucatrol, and this medication is used uh, for type 2 diabetes. Uh, going back, thinking about uh, type 2 diabetes and, and why blood sugars are elevated, that type of thing, um, insulin is going to play a huge role uh, in lowering blood sugars and helping us get our patients to our A1C goal. Uh, insulin is released from the pancreas, specifically from, from beta cells, and glipizide actually stimulates the pancreas or beta cells uh, to release that insulin. And obviously, as we get more insulin into the bloodstream, uh, having its effects, uh, we lower blood sugar. Insulin, remember, promotes uh, the storing of glucose essentially in the liver as glycogen, and so that's going to ultimately uh, lower blood sugar. Now, side effects, uh, very, very similar to uh, insulin, okay? Hypoglycemia and weight gain. Those are by far the two things uh, that you're going to want to worry about and monitor for the most. Um, on Upon initiation, there have been rare cases of, you know, skin reactions and, and things like that as well with glipizide. Um, but again, not, not incredibly common and probably not much more so than, than any other medication as well. But um, hypoglycemia, weight gain. And because of those two adverse effects, um, that's one of the reasons why this class of drug has, has really fallen out of favor. Um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, these drugs were, were used all the time, but now we've got a lot of newer agents uh, SGLT2s, uh, GLP1s, uh, so which are, are generally better tolerated, and we don't have as much hypoglycemia risk, and we don't have as much weight gain risk, uh, which is always a, a concern in our type 2 diabetes patients who are often um, already overweight. Uh, dosing, glipizide is typically going to be dosed uh, once daily. Uh, however, as those doses escalate, um, you will likely see that, that dose split up, particularly uh, with the uh, immediate release dosage form. Uh, there is an extended release dosage form as well, and it's important to, to note that the administration of those two does differ a little bit. So uh, immediate release is typically uh, 30 minutes before meals, and that's done to kind of help ensure that it's absorbed uh, at a you know fairly stable or regular rate, because uh, if you give it with food, there have been reports of of that absorption being vari- variable and then kind of affecting um, blood sugars in a, in a variable manner as well. Now the extended release, um, giving that one with breakfast is fine, and and that's typically uh, how it's done. It's given with meals and like I said, typically breakfast. So that, that's an important distinction, I think, to remember uh, between dosage forms is the uh, timing of administration. Now, you may get into situations clinically where, you know, a patient has said, well, I've taken my immediate release, you know, with meals all my life. I've never had an issue. And, you know, that's a situation where you're probably going to have some common sense and clinical judgment and, um, you know, maybe rely on the patient's history and consistency there. So, um, you know, use some common sense with with that information, that type of thing. But uh, typically, if we're going to uh, start uh, IR or immediate release or extended release in in patients, um, we're going to typically want to try to uh, recommend it. Um, as the manufacturer intended there. 
Uh, let's talk about uh, CKD, which is often uh, you know a common complication from long-term diabetes. Uh, so if we're going to use a sulfonylurea, again, these drugs have definitely fallen out of favor a little bit and aren't used as much. Um, glipizide is the preferred sulfonylurea in chronic kidney disease. Okay, so medication like glyburide, that's another sulfonylurea. That one's a little bit more concerning about, you know, changes in absorption or excuse me, elimination and things like that, uh, where the dosages can accumulate a little bit more. So we're still going to want to use caution um, in patients on glipizide with CKD and maybe monitor them a little bit more closely, particularly if we're changing doses and or there's renal function changes. Um, but glipizide is the uh, preferred agent there. And then, of course, in our geriatric patient population, um, as patients get older, um, we're, we're generally going to um, have less aggressive A1C goals. And so we, you know, we might do slower titration um, and or less aggressive dosing um, with, uh, you know, a drug like sulfonylureas. And that's to prevent the negative side of uh, hypoglycemia, or at least lower the risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, I did, I do get asked about uh, the sulfa warning. Um, so glipizide is a sulfonylurea, so um, theoretically, there could be some cross reactivity with a patient that's had like a Bactrim allergy or an allergy to a, a sulfonamide antibiotic. Um, this is really quite low, extremely low in the literature as far as the cross reactivity risk. Now, you're probably going to want to find out at least, you know, what the reaction was. Let's say you've got a Bactrim allergy on the list. Um, definitely find out what that allergy was and, you know, if it was a, a minor rash that resolved right away or something or, you know, GI upset, uh, you know, obviously that's probably a situation where it's it's probably not going to be any higher risk to use a sulfonylurea uh, than it would be to, you know, use any other drug or that type of thing. So, again, find out what the reaction was. Uh, you know, if they had a situation where they had uh, Steven Johnson syndrome and, and almost died or something um, because of, of an allergic reaction to uh, Bactrim, that's a situation like, okay, well, we might uh, want to do a, a little bit further digging and, you know, maybe try to figure out another option for their diabetes or, you know, at least weigh that risk versus benefit of using a sulfonylurea um, compared to uh, selecting a, another agent. So um, kind of use some, some common sense with that. Obviously, the literature changes over time. So um, definitely do some, some digging and, and that sort of thing if you're considering um, using glipizide uh, in a patient with a significant sulfa allergy. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we will wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, like pharmacotherapy, ambulatory care, medication therapy management, geriatrics, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. If you're a pharmacy student, we've got uh, links to our NAPLEX content as well. So definitely go check out uh, those resources. Uh, if you're a healthcare professional, nurse, med student, or any other professional that has to go through pharmacology courses, that type of thing, um, we've got a lot of resources, books, case studies, uh, drug interactions, all sorts of different stuff uh, uh, through our Am Amazon links and as well as our uh, Audible links too. So um, again, all those links, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so let's talk drug interactions a little bit. Um, first and foremost, you know, any diabetes medication is going to potentially increase the risk for hypoglycemia. Okay, that's pretty common sense. You add a diabetes medication that's going to lower blood sugar and they're taking a sulfonylurea, we could lower that blood sugar further and potentially um, cause a low blood sugar event. Uh, other medications, quinolone antibiotics, um, beta blockers, and their potential to maybe mask hypoglycemia, uh, those are all uh, potential medications that could uh, raise the risk for hypoglycemia. 
Uh, and then, of course, I, I've covered these in, in other topics as well, but you got to think about meds that raise blood sugar and could potentially uh, oppose the beneficial effects of glipizide. So your corticosteroids, for example, your antipsychotics, you know, lanzapine, clozapine come to mind. Uh, stimulants may raise blood sugars. Um, some of the uh, transplant medications, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, uh, these are all meds that could raise blood sugars and, and potentially uh, oppose glipizide's beneficial effects. And then there are some potential SIP interactions. I would not categorize them as very significant, but something to maybe think about. And usually you're probably going to recognize these drugs as having uh, notorious drug interactions. So uh, fluconazole is uh, one that I've, I've seen happen. Uh, this is a can inhibit CYP2C9 to a certain extent. And in that setting, um, that could increase the concentration of uh, glipizide. On the flip side, classic enzyme inducer rifampin, that could induce CYP2C9, and that may lower concentrations of glipizide, which subsequently uh, could potentially uh, raise blood sugars. So again, we're going to monitor those patients, you know, watch for hypoglycemia if concentrations are going to go up, you know, watch for hyperglycemia if concentrations of the drug are going to go down. Um, so I, th I think it's important to, to recognize that. Uh, as far as other, you know, drug interactions, not an incredible amount, I, I would say. Obviously, that's just a, a quick list of some of the most important ones, um, in, in my opinion there. But um, certainly, there is a, a much longer list if you go look at uh, up-to-date or, or other resources there. Uh, that's about it for Glipizide today. I thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you got suggestions, comments, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. MedEducation101 at gmail.com. Or else you can track me down, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS at LinkedIn. Uh, definitely don't hesitate to connect with me there. And leave us a rating review on iTunes if you picked up a clinical pearl or uh, enjoyed this uh, episode today. Also, go ahead, support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store. I'm greatly appreciative to all of you who have uh, done that. Again, lots of different options books, case studies, study materials, um, go support uh, our sponsor there and uh, help keep this podcast free and educational for all to enjoy. All right, well, I'm going to sign off. Again, thank you so much for listening. Uh, appreciate you all being here and uh, have a great rest of your day.